All right, you guys ready? Uh, yes. I'm gonna turn off the waiting room and I'm gonna go mute for like two seconds, but no worries, okay? Okay. Okay, I'll mute too then. Hello everyone and welcome to History on Huntington Ave, a virtual look at Northeastern's campus then and now. This event is being held exclusively for members of the Annual Leadership Gift Circle and the Northeastern Loyalty Society. My name is Katie Shea and I manage the Annual Leadership Gift Circle, which recognizes all donors who give $1,000 or more on a yearly basis. And I am Sarah Pelletier. I manage the Northeastern Loyalty Society, which recognizes undergraduate alumni who have made a gift of any amount for at least the last two years in a row. We want to say a special thank you to everyone tuning in for being our most loyal and generous donors and for your continued support of the university. Sarah and I will be here throughout the presentation to assist with questions, technical or otherwise. Feel free to post comments about your favorite Northeastern memories in the chat. And if you've stumped us with a question that we can't answer and your fellow attendees can't answer, we'll follow up with you afterwards. But the only way to do this is to make sure your name appears correctly in the Zoom meeting. To do so, please hover over your name and click on the more button and then select rename. Without further ado, we'd like to turn this over to our presenter today, Diana Bronchuk. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Bronchuk and by weekday, I work in the Office of Alumni Relations at Northeastern. I completed my master's in corporate and organizational communication this past December, and I just started the master's of public administration this summer. So, I definitely have some resilience in me. Outside of Northeastern, I'm a volunteer tour guide for the nonprofit Boston by Foot, leading historical and architectural walking tours of Boston, pre and post quarantine. Here I am in the bottom left corner at the past Huskies versus Red Sox spring training barbecue with my colleague Sarah Peltier, who you just heard from, Charles Cormier, and as well as the Red Sox legend Keith Folk. Yes, he was incredibly nice. And yes, I do have fun at my job. I'm excited to lead you through this virtual event of Northeastern's Boston campus. For those of you who were on the earlier History on Huntington Avenue tour in April, I took in a lot of feedback, talked to the library, and even went on campus earlier this week to take photos of the new additions to keep the Northeastern community safe. As a history buff, I'm excited to tell you about the university's humble beginnings, the historic stops on campus, as well as how Northeastern is showing his showing its resilience in the pandemic. Before we begin, I just want to ask you to please remain muted. You can also turn off your video if you'd like to. And just like what Sarah and Katie said, type in your questions and your memories in the chat feature. I love reading them later on and it definitely helps prepare for future tours too. And just to let you know, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted on the Northeastern Advancement YouTube channel. So I created a poll asking you all, when was the last time you were on campus? I'm just going to end this and just look at it. All right, so a few of you haven't been on campus since like two or three years ago. And for those six people who haven't been on campus since you graduated or about 10 years ago, I want, I hope we can see each other soon, see each other soon on Huntington Ave when it's all safe to do so. But for right now, let's dive into our home in between the orange and green line on Huntington Ave. 
So obviously we have to start our tour at the very beginning of Northeastern in the halls of the Young Men's Christian Association of Greater Boston. The first YMCA chapter in North America established in 1851. In the late 1800s, the, evening di the educational director of the Evening Institute, Franklin Palmer Spear, wanted to start a night school and started all the paperwork in 1896. The first class was on October 3rd, 1898, and it became the foundation of our beloved Northeastern University. But did you know it actually didn't start on Huntington Ave? In fact, this building right here is considered the third home of the YMCA in Boston, and this was located in Back Bay on the corner of Berkeley and Boylston Streets in 1883. So this is really the birthplace of Northeastern, not necessarily Huntington Ave, but unfortunately this building was burnt down in 19, 1910. And so the Y decided that they wanted to get some much larger space. Back Bay was already a popular neighborhood at the time, and so they looked further down the street in the South End neighborhood. In the South End neighborhood. So while they were building their next home, <laughs> As we see here, they originally start, they originally built the Boltoloff building in 1911, which soon was renamed South Building, for those of you who may have taken a class there, and, th and then it was renamed to Coolnane Hall in September of 1985, making that the oldest building on campus. So by the time the evening, so then most of the classes then moved into this new, this new building in 1913, and by the time that the Evening Institute had moved into the new Y building, there were already five schools attached to it. There was the first autom automotive school that opened up in 1903, the Evening Law School that opened up in 1904, the Evening Polytech School in 1904 as well, the School of Commerce and Finance for all of those business, DeMore McKim School of Business <laughs> alumni here in 1907, and then in 1909, the Cooperative Engineering School which started co-op in 1909. Does anyone know if Northeastern was the first school to introduce co-op? We'll just see in the chat. I see a few people saying yes, but I hate to break it to you. No, Northeastern was not. It was actually the second school to introduce co-op right after the University of Cincinnati in 1906. But don't worry, by 1913, Northeastern was, Northeastern was getting really large and, get, and having all these amazing opportunities for the, men of, for the working men of Boston. But it was still called the Evening Institute for Young Men. Not long after moving into the building, the Evening Institute began shaping up to be the bigger, greater institution that it was, the bigger, greater institution. And in 1916, the, North, the Northeastern College of Boston YMCA was incorporated by the Department of Education. Franklin Palmer Spear was named the first president. And then the next year, the first cauldron was published. And in 1919, the first banquet for Northeastern alumni was held. And Northeastern was only going to continue to grow. In 1922, after the Department of Student Activities opened, Northeastern became a university, but still kept its ties to the YMCA until 1948, when it officially separated. But don't fear, we still have a great relationship with the Y, and in 2011, we helped renovate the gymnasium and class spaces. In fact, we still have some classes and dorms being offered. In 320, this big door that you see right here, just wanted to give you kind of a better close-up photo of it, and this is called Hastings Hall. It is used as a dormitory and some of the classrooms are in it. And as you can see, Northeastern has placed these special signs on the door showing which one to enter, and which one to exit out to try to keep a good flow during this pandemic times. All right, Sarah and Katie, are there any questions before I move on to the next stop? No questions yet. Okay, no problem. Well, I guess we should move further down the street then, shall we? All right, I'm pretty sure a bunch of you already have photos taken at this sign from your graduation days or even your first days on campus. So a stone throw away from the YMCA is what I like to think of as Northeastern's front gate to the city, Crencement Quad, named after World War II veteran, entrepreneur, trustee emeritus, and 1949 alumnus Harvey Crencement and his wife, Farla Crencement, 
1996. Anybody here from the class of 1949? I wonder who's the who the oldest class who the oldest class representative is. You can type that up in the chat. So some of you may have remembered this quad being called Ryder's Mound when President Ryder was leading campus. But as you can see in this photo from 1915, it was at one time just a plain dirt lot. Yep, right here, if you can see from my cursor, this is the YMCA building that we were just talking about. And this was literally soon to become the Crenspring Quad. All this dirt and all this accessible land available. And this wasn't even purchased by Northeastern until 1929. And now in this quad is the home of North, some of Northeastern's most historic buildings, such as Dodge Hall, which opened up in 1953, serving as the library until Snell opened in 1990. Does anyone remember going to Dodge for a late night study session? You could type that up in the chat if you'd like. And then across the quad, you can see in this photo from 1957, excuse me, yes, in 1957 is when this photo was taken, Richards Hall, which was actually the first building to be constructed by the university in 1938. By this time, Northeastern was still occupying the wise buildings in the areas, but do you notice this building across the street? It looks pretty nice. I think it, it's definitely not there anymore. This is the Boston Opera House. Built in 1909 as a home for the city's lyrical dramas, the Boston City Building Department declared the Opera House unsafe in 1957. The deed went through different hands until being sold to Northeastern's President L later on in the year, to which case we open to Spear Hall. In 1964, Spear Hall opened as a dormitory for women. Female students were admitted to Northeastern's day colleges since 1943, and Spear Hall was one of the many residence halls to be built in the 60s, but Northeastern's largest student body were still commuters from local Boston communities to neighbor in nearby suburbs. So I know as you probably are all wondering, what is this white tent doing here in front of Spear Hall? Well, as part of the as part of showing some resilience towards the pandemic and trying to keep our campus safe, Northeastern has set up many of these outdoor dining tents for students. You can see here there's this red sign that's just saying what's the highest occupancy rate in the tent. You can go through the doors. It was a pretty nice and sunny day on Monday when I took this photo, so the flaps were up, but come the cooler weather and probably today the flaps will be down and there will be heaters put in these tents as well. So people will still want to enjoy outdoor dining all year round. Any questions before we move from the, seat, from the city's theater world to the sports, Sarah and Katie? No questions, but I do want to do a brief shout out to Marshall who was on campus in 1949. What? That's Pretty awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, a lot of people have some great memories in Dodge. Um, yeah, taking classes, studying. Uh, Rick remembers his specific class and specifically what he learned in that class. So that's really great. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, Dodge has definitely been, it's been the, the main offices for the DeMore McKinn School of Business for I believe the past 10 years. And the first floor was just recently renovated, so it's a really nice lounge area with these giant screens showing the stock market, the stock market as well as just 24-7 news. So for those who haven't been back on campus for the past 10 years or since graduating, I do recommend checking it out. Actually, Diana, we do have a couple questions. Sure. Um, do you know what year the Opera Hall was demolished? Yes. Let me... In 1957, that was when the whole Opera House closed, and I believe in 1961 was when it was officially um, burnt, demolished. <laughs> Sorry to think of the other word for it, but that a wrecking ball just came into my mind. So yes. <laughs> Great. And then um, Henry has his 50th anniversary in 2021, which is so exciting. Um, oh, congrats, Henry. Yeah. Do you know if there will be a golden graduate ceremony? We're hoping for it. Obviously, we're trying to, obviously, we're working with the commence, the larger commencement team on it. And com hopefully, commencement can happen on campus. Um, crossing our fingers for us to be able to have the Golden Graduate Ceremony with it as well. Great. I think that's it for questions right now. All right. Okay. Well, let's move forward then. Now, 
I've already kind of given you guys a hint with how my photo is. I was very excited to be next to Key Folk. So if that tells you that I'm a Red Sox fan, I am <laughs> a large Red Sox fan. So, but in 1961, and that's how I'm going to transition into this part here. In 1961, Northeastern had purchased over 20 acres of Huntington Avenue property that basically extended the main campus to Ruggles Street, right here. Ruggles being here, excuse me, no, Ruggles being further out on the photo, but as you can see here, this is becoming the orange line, a little bit of the Ruggles station right here. And as you can see, in 19, also in this 1961 photo, there's a lot of parking lots, a lot of students' cars being parked here. If you see your car, please let us know, and soon to be even more parking lot spaces here as well. And that was all obviously to support the commuter student body and, <clears throat> excuse me, and then sooner rather than later, ultimately supporting just more location spaces for classrooms. But Huntington Avenue was kind of sacred ground to Boston. When the YMCA was still in Back Bay, Huntington Avenue was only known for one thing, and that was baseball. So what we're seeing right here is the Huntington Avenue baseball grounds that were built in 1901, taking over the Huntington Carnival lot that was used for circuses. The field's first game was on May 8th that year, and close to 11,500 people could be seated to watch the Boston Americans, the first iterations of today's Red Sox, including their loyal group of fans, the Royal Rooters. It was on these grounds where the first World Series games were held between the Boston Americans and the Pittsburgh Pirates the Red Sox first rival. The series were held between October 1st to October 13th in 1903. Four out of the eight games were played here and this guy was pitching them. Yes, Cy Young, arguably the greatest pitcher in baseball history was on the Boston Americans and took the, and took the mound on the Huntington Avenue baseball grounds during the series and most of his baseball career, including the first perfect game where no player on the losing team makes it to base in MLB history on May 5th, 1904. Cy Young retired at the age of 45 in 1911, and that seems to be the year when the Boston Red Sox decided to make home elsewhere. The last game played on Huntington Avenue was on October 7th, 1911, and grass was ripped from the field to be put into the new stadium in Fedway Park. So you see, Northeastern has always had a special connection to the Boston Red Sox, even if some of our students are not fans. I do want to point out though, so this statue, yes, we, Cy is wearing a mask. This statue is placed on World Series Way on campus. And about 60 feet away from this statue is a home plate that is in the dirt to try to commemorate the, try to give another, try to, get, to commemorate Huntington Avenue baseball grounds as well. But that's not really where home plate was. As you can see in this photo, where the statue is, place today, home plate is actually under the Snell Engineering Building today. So, but right next to Cy Young statue is Cabot, the Physical Education Center. Built in 1954, it's placed largely in the middle of what was the baseball diamond, but the Cy Young statue was erected in 1993 and is placed near the, being placed near the pitcher's mound. And as you can see today, Cabot is being used as the COVID-19 testing center on campus. As here you can see students are lining up to get the, to have their testing appointment be screened as well as their daily wellness check. And then they go through into the center. I can't, I couldn't take photos inside the center for you all, but I do want you to know though that this system has been, is incredibly, it's just so well put together. It's incredibly, incredibly structured. I've now gotten a few tests here on campus. They all take under five minutes. You should, I'm incredibly impressed by everybody who is involved and you should be as well. So any questions, Katie and Sarah? Um, we do have one. It says, what year was the first year of Huntington Gardens pre-1903? Huntington Gardens? Yeah. Pre 1903, so it became so the Huntington Avenue baseball grounds were formed in 1901, 
So I'm assuming Huntington Gardens is something completely different. I'll make note of that and do some research on there. Do you mind um, asking that person for their name and email, Katie, and I can get back to them later on? Sure. Thank you. So. Oh, he, well, it was Carl. He meant the stadium. 1901 answered his question. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> no worries, Carl. Before that, it was just plainly a dirt lot that circuses use, as well as some rodeos and other large events, too. Um, oh, MJ wanted to ask the pronunciation of Botolf. I think it's Botolf, right, Diana? I've said Botolf. Oh, Botolf. Um, but it could be Botolf. That street is actually named after... <laughs> it was a monastery, St. Botolph's Monastery in England that actually is the actually is where the name Boston stems from. I didn't go too deep of a dive, but I was just looking up where, why exactly this, what, as part of Boston by Foot, we actually have an upcoming event about Boston Street's names, and that was one of the biggest names because there wasn't really a monastery around there, and nobody really knows who St. Bo Bodoloff is that actually did stem from a monastery in England that then led to the name of Boston in England, which then led to the name of Boston, Massachusetts. Wow, that's really interesting. I um, know, everybody's learning something new today. Yeah, Sharon said, wow, does that mean we've been mispronouncing it for all these years? And I'm sure some people have. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I'm probably mispronouncing it <laughs> as well. I mean, it's uh, possible. You can pronounce it any way you want. I know. Truly. If anybody else has questions about pronunciation, we can all just, we can all learn together. Yeah. <laughs> um, Henry wanted to know, do we know the total cost before and after financial aid of Northeastern today? I don't, do you know the total cost, Diana? I do not off the top of my head, just because of everything going on with the pandemic and going back and forth on different charges. So okay. our Henry, apologies we'll there. That afterwards and I can send you that information. Um, let's see, um, Henry had a great memory. The train stopped at that dirt park. That was the way the circus arrived there. Um, oh, really? Ran away from home with the circus from that location. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, oh, great. Someone, Jennifer, answered the tuition question in the chat. Thank you, Jennifer. I think that's it for questions right now. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned being able to see the circus from the train station because when you're on the orange line and you do go and we and you go in between Ruggles stop and Mass Ave stop, you actually do see a little bit of campus such as the the interdisciplinary science and engineering complex, my uh, the building that my office is in, 716 Columbus, and if you look towards the right, you also see the tops of the different buildings in the Robeson Quad. So. You see so much just sitting on a train. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next stop then. All right, so I'm going to be throwing a lot of different photos at you guys, but no worries. You can ask Sarah or Katie in the chat to just go back to them. So now remember when I said, I, when I said that Huntington Avenue land, that the land that was purchased was being converted into parking lots? So that was kind of an exaggeration, but where commuter students greatly outnumbered residential students, a lot of our current green space on campus were once lots. Here in this aerial shot of campus of 1963, you can see cars bordering, bordering the up and coming orange line. The up and coming orange line. Do you notice some of your classroom buildings such as Nightingale and Robeson? Also Dodge, Ryder, Dodge, Ry Richards, excuse me. Hayden, L, a little bit of the, little bit of what was to become Curry Student Center, or the Greenleaf Building that housed ROTC on the left-hand side, and then obviously this area of the southwest part of campus has dramatically changed. Again, if anybody sees their car down there, let me know, or even type in the chat what car you drove and drove in there. And so, as I fast forward from 1963 to 1965, we have a better, we have a much more clearer view and in color. Right here, this is Huntington Avenue. This is Spear Hall, another parking lot that was soon to become the Marino Recreation Center today. You could also see some of your dorm buildings on Hemingway. 
another parking lot that is behind, I believe, St. Stephen's somewhere over here. And then we have just all of Columbus Ave is basically parking. So really cool to see. Diana, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to share this memory in the chat. I think it's so cool. Sharon remembers her car getting stuck in one of the parking lots <laughs> during the blizzard of 78. <laughs> well, I love that. Car, Sharon, but that's a great historic memory. Oh, that's really cool. Did anybody help you out, Sharon? I know. I hope someone helped her dig it I out. I know, really. <laughs> I've been, I'm a true blue... I'm a true blue New England girl. I always have a shovel in my trunk, no matter what time of the year it is, and a snow brush. My parents <laughs> taught me well. So, well, let me fast forward then to 1985. We have a completely new angle here. Right down here is the Museum of Fine Arts. So we're kind of looking up Huntington this way down here. You go up to Hemingway. We see Spear, Stetson's. Over here is the Krenzman Quad. There's Cabot, here's Stearns, moving forward, moving down into what was going to become more of the law school area and quarry today. So again, this is 1985 and we still see some parking options for students, but come the mid 1990s is really where we see the big transformation into Centennial Commons. Because over here, just gonna show you, here we have some parking, well, more, more cars, and now it's this. <laughs> this is Centennial Common. This green space was part of the Centennial Campaign celebrating Northeastern's 100 years that was launched in 1994. And so after looking at the three or four decades of photos that we just saw with all the different parking lots, you may have, is it surprising to see so much green space now? Would it be even more surprising to hear that Northeastern has become an arboretum? Yeah. In fact, in May of 2019, Northeastern was given level two arboretum status, which means it has over 140 different tree species, and there's over 1,400 individual trees on campus. Really cool. There's a special website dedicated to the arboretum and all the different species on campus too. And as you can see here, Students are just loving this open space and being able to truly study, have some space, have some greenery to themselves, take in the fresh air. A lot of events are also held here on campus for those, for those of you who graduated in the 2000s. Commencement Fest happens here. Some barbecues happen out here, Giving Day. We have a bunch of stuff happening out here as well. And it really truly has become kind of the park for Northeastern. And it's also, oh, and also has direct access to different cultural centers on campus, such as the John D. O'Brien African American Institute that opened in 1968 right over here. And some of the city's most beautiful public murals. And I do mean the city's public murals because President Aoun launched the Public Arts Initiative to bring local and national and international artists on campus to bring art for all campus visitors to enjoy. And Centennial Common is home to a few of the larger ones, such as this one, Ars et Ciencia, which you can see a little bit here on Mercer Hall. And my personal favorite, which is one of the newer murals and the largest, 999 Cranes by Silvia Lopez Chavez, that brings color to Ruggles Station. And it's one of the, Ruggles Station, which is one of the first bridges to Northeastern's neighboring communities. I truly believe that Centennial Common does symbolize the transformation of Northeastern from being the well-known commuter school and in coming into the mid 1990s, in the mid 1900s to the premier research institution that it is today. Any questions before you move on to new bridges on campus? Yes, Diana, we have a few questions. Oh boy. Um, let me scroll back a little. I don't want to forget anyone. Um, Jack asked, do we still have a mayor of Huntington Ave and Mr. or Miss Husky? So we do not have Miss or Miss, we do not have a Mr. or Miss Husky anymore. I do believe that some of the fraternities and sororities were trying to revive that in later in earlier years, 
but we actually revived back the mayor of Huntington Avenue this past year. We took kind of a five year hiatus, but we celebrated that again. And the former mayor of, <laughs> mayor of Huntington Avenue, Emily Blackwell, actually came back on campus to judge. So we brought back some old traditions and gave them some new life. Great. Um, Marshall wants to know what happened to the original library building. He remembers it as the second building next to the Y. Do you remember, do you know what building was the library before Snell was built? So that was Dodge Hall. Um, so we show, I showed you some photos of Dodge Hall. It's still there today. Um, and so that was the library up until 1990 when Snell opened, I believe. I'll have to double check my notes on the year. But yes, that was the library. I did read that there were also smaller libraries on in some other buildings on campus, but they kind of moved around just given, it was a specific like engineering library that I believe was in the prelude to the Snell engineering building, which I believe was in Hayden. Um, but yes, it was, Dodge Hall was considered the campus library before Snell. Awesome. Uh, Sharon updated us about her car. Her boyfriend was able to help her find it. So all's well that ends well with that. Oh, good. God. Um, <laughs> Carl wanted to know the 1400 trees. Does that fold into the fact that Northeastern wants to be carbon neutral? He said, not sure if they are or not, but he hopes that they are. It's definitely a step towards being more green on campus green being environmentally sound um, and having better and having a better carbon footprint. Um, I will say though, the head of facilities who is really this, the leader behind pushing the Arboretum status, he is a phenomenal guy. Of course, his name escapes me, but he actually led a tour of the Arboretum for the NU at noon, the NU at noon events. And I got to walk around the got to walk around with him as well. And he has been on campus for the past 40 years. Um, and he has pointed out some trees that he himself had planted as saplings that have now grown to be these large, magnificent, these large, magnificent trees on campus. So yes, in the short answer to that. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then we have a couple cool memories. Um, Martha remembers that she stayed in Whitehall and Whitehall was actually part of Tufts Dental School in the 50s, so she ended up staying in the same dorm as her dad had stayed at, which is- Oh, that's so cool. cool. Um, and Maureen said that in 1961, women weren't allowed to wear pants. Um, I heard about that. Employers on the trolley or sidewalk, that's crazy. Um, I, so what a great memory to share. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. I heard about that. I recently had a conversation with another alumna who was one of the first residents of Spear Hall and she had told me that she was only allowed to wear pants for Sunday breakfast. Wow. I know, right? <laughs> Time changes. Yeah, I think that's it for questions for right now, Diana. No problem. Fun fact though for those, fun fact about the Arboretum too, I just remembered this, there are actually wild berries grown on campus that are edible. I had one myself. It doesn't really have a taste to it, but if you guys see a wild berry on campus, you can eat them. I wouldn't suggest it, but that's another reason to go back to campus for those who haven't been in a while. All right, so we'll head back over. So let's talk about some other bridges to the neighboring communities. I'm pretty sure some of you have already heard about the ISIC building and Definitely, it is one of Northeastern's largest faces across the Orange Line tracks. It is the Interdisciplinary Science and Engineering Complex right here at the top. And it is the first private research development in Roxbury. It opened in 2017 to a grand ceremony. And it, dedicated, it has labs dedicated to sending projects to Mars, computer science developments, and many more, all that are exposed by the ginormous walls of windows when you walk into the atrium down here. Many marvel at this stellar spiral staircase that almost leads visitors to the large skylight opening, to large sky, skylight opening, all the developments happening in the classroom spaces to everyone. Isaac was awarded the 2018 Harlson Parker Medal and was named the most beautiful building in Boston by Boston Society of Architects. Fun fact, another building in Boston <laughs> Was also named the was also named the most beautiful building in 1969, and most recently it was voted the most ugliest building 
in all of Massachusetts. Can anybody take a guess what that building was? If you can't, that's fine. I'll tell you it was Boston City Hall. I'm not saying that ISIC will fall, will one day be considered ugly. I highly doubt that it is absolutely gorgeous, but I just like to point that out when I read that. It's like, oh, it shares something in common. And I also like Boston City Hall too for other historical reasons. So with such a large, with such a large gorgeous space across the tracks, we need to make sure that everyone can easily access it and be able to get to, the commu to other communities as well. And so they built a bridge. And I'm going to show you all a video of how this bridge was being built. And so being placed between two subway lines can cause some restrictions for a growing campus, but we took that challenge and produced some grand results. The pedestrian bridge that opened in spring 2019 was such an engineering feat that this 30 second video doesn't do the three hour job justice. The bridge required one of the largest cranes on the East Coast that took weeks to assemble alone. And within the early morning on Sunday, October 14th, students and faculty took a seat within ISIC to watch this historical scientific pursuit at three o'clock in the morning. I was talking to one of the students who was there the, next, the following days and they came in with a sleeping bag, two boxes of pizza, their computer, and they were just so excited to watch this happen. So, and being built right next to ISIC is what some students are already calling ISIC 2, but will actually be named EXP as part of the Northeastern 2025 plan. So I was able to snag this photo for you guys. Don't worry, I was completely safe while doing it. This, is, this building is slated to open in 2023 and will be space for research across disciplines and areas such as cybersecurity, robotics, coastal sustainability, community resilience, and drug delivery. And so, ISIC is considered, ISIC and the pedestrian bridge are definitely example of nor, examples of Northeasterns connecting to the local communities. But one fantastic partnership our Office of City and Community Affairs has open, has is Northeastern Crossing, which was open in 2015. Located at International Village, Northeastern Crossing is a community center for the local Roxbury community that holds events such in classes such as Afro yoga, English learning courses, financial literacy, financial literacy cor courses, as well as some other professional development topics. Northeastern Crossing was part of the university's 2013 institutional master plan to build new connections with our neighboring communities. And another great example of this is actually right up the street too. Before we move up to net, next stop, any questions? Um, Brian just had a question about the architect who designed ISEC but um, I told him it was Payette, a Boston-based architectural firm. Do you know anything else about that, Diana? I know that there were multiple iterations in the beginning of the different, I know that there were just multiple different designs for ISIC from that architectural firm, as well as some other competing ones. And I believe the reason why the spiral staircase is in is actually in ISIC is because of that architectural firm was the only one to have it in there and President Alvin thought that it was so beautiful that that's one of the reasons why they chose that design, that arch, that firm. Awesome. I think that's it for right now. All right, no problem. So we're going to move on to actually my favorite area of campus, which happens to be across from my building, my office building. So while Huntington Avenue is the title street for this virtual tour, Columbus Avenue has become another prominent street on the main Boston campus. Originally called Lowell Street or Pinchion Street, after the founder of Roxbury in Springfield, Massachusetts, Columbus Avenue has held many historic moments for community members. Many happening on Carter Park that we see, well, an old photo of Carter Park that we see here. Renamed after Sergeant William E. Carter, an African-American veteran of the Spanish and American War and World War I, Carter Park is the largest city park in the South End and Roxbury communities and a platform for recreation as well as social justice. It was here that buses left with volunteers for the March on Washington in 1963. Martin Luther King Jr. also led a freedom rally from here to the Boston Common on April 22, 1965 for Boston's black community to promote the civil rights movement and bringing quality and justice to Boston. 
And as part of the Boston Parks Department, Northeastern started a private public relationship with the city in 2015 to commit $108 million to renovate and maintain the historic land. And this was the outcome of that partnership. In September of 2018, Carter Park reopened for fall, for fall soccer and football leagues. A tot lot over here dedicated to Victoria McGrath, to Victor, Victoria McGrath of DMSB 2015 was opened up. It is one of the most accessible, one of the most accessible and accommodating playgrounds in Boston. The mayor also wel welcomed this new partnership for the park to be used all year round with an inflatable bubble dome to cover the football field for sports leagues to continue in the winter. And I'm going to show you this video just because this bubble is so cool. And I can't truly describe what it's like to stand inside the bubble, but it truly brings a smile to my face to not only see this giant bubble when I'm walking to work, but young kids still being able to practice during the winter, their favorite sports. Any questions? No questions yet. All right, no problem. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, people are enjoying Carter Park right now. They are all wearing their masks. And being able to still have some fun. Okay, I would not be able to have this tour if I did not talk about Matthews Arena. And as I've already told you guys, I am a baseball fan and a Red Sox fan, so obviously I was excited to talk about the World Series, but I'm even more excited to talk about Matthews and how historic it truly is for Boston. So, our home, the home of our proud Husky hockey and basketball teams is also the home of a variety of other famous teams as well. Open in, opening in April of 1910, the Boston Arena was more of a multi-use space hosting hockey, boxing matches, political rallies, circuses, and rodeos. While Northeastern's male hockey team was first started in 1929 in this arena, the Boston Bruins were founded here in 1924 as well as the Boston Celtics in 1946. And if you're not a Boston sports team fan, why aren't you? Another NHL team actually calls the Boston Arena their home as well, the Carolina Hurricanes. I know. They were found in Boston under the name the New England Whalers, and they actually have a unique history that I recommend looking into if you're interested. But how did the Boston Arena become the, Ma the Matthews we all know and love? Well, Northeastern purchased the arena in 1979 and renamed it in honor of trustee emeritus and 1956 alumnus George J. and Hope M. Matthews in 1982. And while the historic building still holds its charm, it has gotten some technology upgrades with a brand new video board that really amps up fans during the sports games. I mean, this thing is huge. It is, my goodness, just absolutely huge. And before I take questions, here's a question for all of you. Do you know if Matthews Arena is the first indoor ice rink in the world? It is actually. It is the old, it's actually considered the world's oldest continuous indoor hockey arena too, beating everything in Canada. But there is some rivalry, there is some point of contention here. There is a arena out in Michigan that claims to be the oldest, the oldest indoor hockey arena that was opened in 1913. <laughs> And the reason why they say that they're the oldest is because Matthews Arena slash the Boston Arena went through a lot of different fires. The most particular in 1918, there was a very large fire, which was one of the main reasons why that facade earlier, this facade was changed to the brick facade. This fire completely burnt down the front part of, had burnt down quite a lot of it. And this arena in Michigan states that that shouldn't count as the, the Boston Arena had to close for some time. We stayed open, so we should be continued the oldest. But I'm pretty sure you all agree with me. Matthews Arena is clearly the oldest one. Any questions, Katie, as I went off on that tangent? Um, no questions, but uh, we do have a cool memory here. Um, Lawrence and Henry saw Muhammad Ali train at Matthews for his fight in Maine. Um, maybe yeah. Or, so that's really cool. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. Definitely Bo the Boston Arena and Matthews Arena was used for a variety of things. Amelia Earhart had a reception in there. I believe JFK launched one of his political campaigns in there. The most silent night in Boston concert happened in there with James Brown. It's, it's held, it's 
truly should be known more than just the birthplace of hockey in the United States. And today I should have also pointed out today it's being used as a mailing center as well. All right. Well, let's go on to one, let's go on to one of the newest expansions of campus. And that is the horticultural building. So Northeastern's Boston campus has expanded all over Huntington Avenue, as you've seen with all the different photos, with administrative offices also at the Christian Science Plaza next to the Prudential Center to Columbus Avenue talked about earlier, further up the street. Earlier this year in February, Northeastern acquired the Massachusetts Horticultural Society building on the corner of Huntington that we see right here. And built in 1901, this building was the third home of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society and housed over thousands of flowers and plants, making Boston into a biodiverse city. So while Northeastern has become an arboretum, I guess you could say this was the biggest indoor arboretum and garden. Basically a big greenhouse, but made out of brick. Regardless, it hosted many different horticultural and gardening organizations, but unfortunately changed hands multiple times after being sold to the neighboring Christian Science Church in 1992, then to Marcus Partners in 2017. Currently, the Boston Magazine, the Museum of Fine Arts, and small art studios use the building to be determined how Northeastern will utilize the building, but let's return back to campus to talk about a true campus icon. Any questions, Katie? Nope, no questions right now. All right, no problem. Okay. So as we go into our last stop here, Northeastern has launched multiple campuses across outside of Boston in Charlotte, Toronto, San Francisco Bay Area, Seattle, Vancouver, London, and most recently Portland, Maine. We all have something that brings us together. The resilience, the courage, and the strength of being a part of Northeastern. And Franklin Palmer Spear, remember our first president, had started brainstorming what could symbolize such a drive and found it in the new frontier at the time, of course. Leonard Seppala that you see here was one of Alaska's great mushers. He was, many, he was one of many dog sled teams that braced the harsh Alaskan wilderness to bring the life-saving serum to the remote town of Nome that was battling a diphtheria epidemic. The trip would normally take 25 days, but Sepla's team, led by Togo, the Siberian Husky, made the trip in half the time, even in the harsh winter storms. Leonard believed Togo should have gotten the newspaper credit, but that was given to Balto on a different sled team, but was happy to hear that a new college on the East Coast in the lower 48 wanted to have Togo as their mascot. Leonard didn't want to make his lead, didn't want to give his lead dog to President Spear, but he gave him a puppy. As we can see here on March 4th, 1927, a huge parade down Huntington Avenue welcomed Sapset, who was given an honorary degree. President Spear presented the pup to the whole campus and renamed the dog King Husky, the first of many to come. And King proved himself to be a worthy mascot when he attended his first sports event, a track meet where Northeastern set three university records. For a short time, live Huskies lived on campus until that was deemed unsafe. A statue commemorating our beloved symbol was erected in L Hall in front of what was to be named Blackman Auditorium in June 1962. And to this day, students will rub the nose and ears as part of the legend to graduate from Northeastern University after they use hand sanitizer, of course, and, bef and before they use hand sanitizer too. You can still see King Husky at campus events when official handler alumna Margaret Cook brings him and some puppies along, especially at FanFest and before the homecoming game. Now before I ask questions, just another fun fact for you all, Northeastern was the first college to, to adopt the Husky ma mascot, so any of those other colleges out there that claim, to, that claim the Husky is theirs, Northeastern had him first. And so, any further questions, Katie? Nope. Um, Henry was asking about the Husky statue still being there, which you answered. Um, yep. That's great. But I don't think any other questions. Some people sharing memories about touching the statue, so that's really cool. Yeah, I actually just I rubbed the ears earlier this week as I've gone back into classes myself. 
and I did rub those ears before my other masters and I graduated so clearly he works <laughs> all right well if there's no further questions Thank you again for joining this virtual tour. I'm very happy to have been able to lead it again for you and I'll pass it on to Katie and Sarah. Thank you so much, Diana, for that great, great presentation. Uh, I know I learned so much. I hope that everyone else here was able to learn a little something as well. Um, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. We will be sending out the recording of this presentation um, sometime next week. Uh, we'll be emailing it to you. Um, if you have any other questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat and we can get, get back to you um, maybe later today or tomorrow with some answers. So thank you. Sarah, did you want to say anything? Yep, nope, just the same thing. Thank you so much and please uh, let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, I'm just reading the chat. I love reading all the different memories. Mm -hmm. Someone talking about Malcolm X being at Matthew, being at the Boston Arena. Yes, I did read about him having different rallies there. Um, there's yeah. so much history on this campus. Oh, somebody was asking about the name of the new building next to Isaac. EXP. Yeah. I did not. I wasn't able to look at what the exact acronym, what that acronym stands for, but it will be EXP. All the students are calling it Isaac Two already, so. But all right. Great. I don't see any other questions. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, a lot of changes to the campus. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.